Good morning, everyone. This is on? Yes, it is. All right. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Hendrik, uh, for your kind and thoughtful opening comments and to the Vice Chan Chancellor for her inspiring words of welcome and uh, to the VUT for hosting this event, uh, to the Rap Dance uh, Management Committee for uh, choosing to invite me this year, I appreciate it very, very much. You don't know how much it means to me. It really is very uh, generous for you to uh, extend the invitation, and I, I uh, of course, happily accept that I, I'm here. And uh, you're right, Hendrik, I'm no longer a spring chicken, and some of us out in the crowd aren't either. You know, looking at 17 years, and yesterday I was thinking about that, it's like, what has changed in, this, in the last 17 years? And I guess most notable are some of the people here. I remember some of the younger students, and you know who you are, that have uh, grown and matured and now are influencing other people. And it's very exciting to, to see that. And thanks to people like Dion DeBeer, and there's a long list of, of others that uh, I wish I had a photographic memory and could name them all, that have influenced these young people and set them on the, the path toward, uh, well, a great future, we think, anyway, uh, one that will uh, become even bigger and better, and I'm referring to the additive manufacturing and 3D printing industry. Terms that are used interchangeably, they really mean the same thing. But it, it's been fun to watch these uh, young people grow and mature and, and uh, and get to the point where they are today. You, you may have heard that we have an election in the United States currently. <laughs> so it's been fantastic to, to take a break away from the madness. <laughs> Although I still have the temptation to flip to the news channel and uh, catch some of the latest news and, and uh, nothing's changed. It's, uh, oh my gosh, it's only six days away now. And so, uh, we'll be able to move on to bigger and better things. <laughs> wow, what a, what a journey it's been. I don't know what to think. Um, <laughs> perhaps enough said. So I'll spend the next, and I did set a timer here, and I agree with Hendrik. We want to be very prompt, and I think it's fair to the speakers that come after each of the speakers to give them the time allotted for them. So I've done my best. Last night I mentioned how I, I tend to uh, add more, I mean, there's so much going on in this industry, there's so much to share and to learn, and so the temptation is to pile so much in, but I, I reduced it to about 38 slides, so roughly a minute per slide, and so hopefully we can uh, do this in the next 45 minutes, now 42 minutes and counting. So we'll talk about the health of the additive manufacturing industry, developments and trends worldwide, uh, mostly about the future, and then I hope and I think we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers at the, the end. So the metal systems that are developing and selling commercially are hot. They are smoking hot. Now, only about 808 systems were sold last year. Fairly small number, but the average selling price of these machines are fairly high. So uh, in, in all, it's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of value there and especially value to the customers of those machines. And so you can see the, the growth curve. You gotta like it if you're a part of this industry. It's, uh, and I'll share some additional comments about that here soon, but it, is, uh, it really is hot, the, the metal additive manufacturing systems. You can see that in years past, they have struggled along at around 100 units for several years, and now we're, uh, we're, we're much stronger. These systems are more open than the polymer system. So this is a count as of April of this year, a count of the third party material suppliers of metal powders worldwide. And not all of them there are like, Alcoa is missing, for example, and, and a number of others. But as of April, this is a snapshot. You know, compare that to only 23 polymer third party suppliers. Yet the polymers have been around since 1988. And you saw the history of the metals. And so that just shows that if you have more of an open business model, open materials model, 
that it creates an opportunity for more companies, more competition, and happier customers. And so uh, I, I believe that with some recent developments, we'll see some of the polymer machine manufacturers also uh, begin to open up their systems as well. Because they'll be forced to, patents are expiring, new machines are developing, new companies are emerging. Metals are not easy. This is uh, something that you'll see over at the exhibits. By the way, I agree with Hendrik. You, you've got to get over to the exhibits and see. This is, will be the most elaborate set of uh, exhibitors ever in the history of the RAPDASA conference and, and now exposition. And so have a look. And this guitar you'll see over there, it's the world's first 3D printed metal guitar. Uh, compliments of, well, the designer is here, Olaf Deagle will be speaking uh, after lunch, keynote speaker. And, but it took quite a bit of work to get to this point. It was not trivial. And, and I, the reason I want to show this is that with metal, unlike, say, polymer laser sintering, for example, you need to build these support structures, which really serve as anchors to anchor the features down to the build plate, to really serve as a heat sink to, because there's so much heat and distortion that the features will warp without these anchors. Now this is metal, this is like a weld to this build plate up to the, all these features. That has to be removed somehow. Now whether it's a guitar or an aerospace part or a medical implant, you have to consider that. You want to have minimal of these supports because you have to remove them, but if you have too few, then the part can warp. And, and it can be bad. In fact, I've even seen it where it'll, it'll actually break away from, and it, it break bolts off that's holding the build plate. That's how much stress that can be built up in these parts. So you have to go through a thermal stress release cycle to relieve that stress before you cut this away from the build plate. So just to give you some sense for what went into this, and I won't spend all, a lot of time, but not only nine hours of printing. This is in, uh, in the American pronunciation is aluminum. And so only nine hours of printing, which is actually a pretty fast build. About 30 hours of cooling, but two days to remove the supports and anchors. And then another two days of filing, sanding, shot painting, basically finishing it up to look like what you'll see over in the exhibits. So four days of work, yet only nine hours of printing, four days of manual work. And so, and so I just want to underscore, there can be at least nine steps after you pull the parts out of the build chamber. You've got the cooling and removal of powder, which can be difficult if you have very fine channels and, and holes through in the part the thermal stress relief, removal of the part from the build plate, hip, which I learned just yesterday, you do not have a hot isostatic pressing facility here in South Africa, uh, which is something that you'll probably need to consider if you're gonna be doing aerospace parts to ensure there's no internal or surface por porosity. So, so that is what uh, companies like GE and Airbus and, and others who are building these uh, flight ready parts are going through HIP to ensure, there, there, may, there may only be uh, far less than 1% of porosity in the part, but you want to get rid of it so there's zero porosity, and you can ensure that through uh, a lot of pressure and heat through HIP can, can, uh, can do that. And then after that, uh, the removal of the supports and, and, and anchors, the uh, possibly further heat treat, uh, a lot of machining in some cases, it depends on the application. And, and then, of course, inspection, and that can be you know, a lot of work, too, depending upon what it's being used for. GE Aviation uh, is a company of the GE conglomerate of companies. There's healthcare, there's uh, wind power, alternative energy. Uh, they make uh, x-ray machines, uh, M MRI machines. There's, there's a lot of GE businesses, appliances, light bulbs, and so forth. Aviation has been one of the leading groups within GE to really pioneer a lot of the work in additive manufacturing. And, and I'm sure a lot of you, in fact, I, before I go on, I, who do we have in the room? How many people are fairly new to additive manufacturing? Let's say in the last year are new to additive manufacturing. Raise your hand, get them up fairly high. Oh, a surprising number, there must be 10 to 15 people. Five years, 
have been in at least five years. You have me on. At least five years, raise your hand. I, I'm sorry, five years or under. Ten? Fifteen? Twenty? Twenty-five? Wow, so we have it all the way from newcomers to people that have been in this for more than 25 years. That's great. So I think it's good to, to, to do, do that exercise. Just to, so for some of us, we make assumptions that you know all of this terminology and how all these processes work and all the companies and so forth. And I think it's dangerous to make that assumption. And I have to remind myself all the time that, hey, we have people every day entering this business for the first time. So, so GE... About, uh, I don't know, was it maybe three weeks ago, they announced that they were going to acquire two companies for $1.4 billion. And it was about a, two weeks ago that one of the major share, shareholders of SLM said, no, we don't like your bid, we want it to go up. And G, GE said, well, no, we're not going to give you any more. It's already a lot of money, like uh, almost, well, more than two-thirds of a billion dollars for this one company. And if you step back 10 years ago, it wasn't worth even a tenth of that. So I thought it was a pretty sweet offer. And I don't know who, if they thought one would be bluffing. In any case, G said, no, we're not gonna do it. And that was, uh, that offer expired a week ago Monday. So this is what, Wednesday, so about uh, nine days ago. Two days later, they announced, well then that Monday, yeah, the offer expired, so the deal was dead. Two days later, GE announced that they are acquiring Concept Laser. Well, 75%, but the majority of Concept Laser. And that was, when was that? Things are starting to become a blur. It was last week. But uh, yeah, so the, the, the two deals are not yet closed, but around $600 million for 75% ownership of Concept Laser. Uh, the valuations of these companies are incredible. That's a lot of money. And so, what's GE going to do with this? Well, GE Aviation alone believes that they could need about a thousand metal machines over the next 10 years. And both of these companies, by the way, uh, RCAM, they do electron beam melting, that's using electron uh, beam energy as the energy source for melting powder and building parts. And then SLM and Concept Laser, they use, uh, it's also a powder bed system, but using a laser instead of electron beam. And so both build, you know, world-class metal parts. And so GE, I think, is uh, afraid that if they get in line and wait for these machines, that it, there'll be a real capacity problem, that these companies are gonna be totally tapped out and, and they will not be able to get a supply of machines as soon as they want, want them. So they wanted to take control of a couple of, of companies so that they could control the supply so they'll be first in line to get machines. They claim that they will continue to keep the brand and sell machines to other companies, even competitors. But you gotta think that if they're developing IP and something very special like uh, process controls that could really give them a competitive advantage. Are they going to share that with their competitors? I don't know, maybe. It's anybody's guess, but if I'm GE, probably not. So I guess time will tell. But in any case, uh, this is a very interesting development, uh, one that I know that EOS has been approached many times and other companies uh, wanting to buy uh, the company. And uh, so uh, we're this is unprecedented. We have not lived in times like this where we're, we're getting these kinds of uh, investments being made. The reason I brought this is because if you step back to 2011, just five years, there were 31 companies worldwide that manufactured and sold industrial grade additive manufacturing systems. And we define industrial grade as those that are priced at 5,000 or more. The average selling price is 97,370 based on our research. So a lot of these machines though, if you go to some of these facilities like the one in the building next to us in uh, CUT and other places, those machines are far greater than 97,000. But what brings that average down 
are some of the lower cost machines that sell from fifteen to, to fifty thousand dollars. But in any case, if you fast forward to last year, sixty two companies, a doubling in the number of companies worldwide that are manufacturing and selling these industrial grade, uh, grade systems. I mentioned that patents are expiring, uh, some new technologies are developing. So, and this is all good for customers because, you know, with, with this com more competitive environment, it means that it'll drive costs down and, and prices downward and hopefully product quality uh, upward. And uh, I wanted to share this so that you can compare it with the next slide. So, we believe that around 12,558 of these industrial grade machines were sold last year compared to 278,000 plus of the desktop, low-cost desktop machines were sold last year. So more than 22 times the number of these, uh, these desktop machines. And the growth, as you can see, about 70%. 70, 70, uh, uh, average selling price around $1,055. Two very different animals. Although I tell you what, they're starting to grow together because you look at the part quality off of some of these newest machines, they're pretty darn good. And in fact, even better than some of the early FDM, FDM standing for Fused Deposition Modeling from Stratasys, which is one of the early companies in this business, uh, you know, as good or better. And so we're seeing a blurring between these two groups. And so, but they're, for the most part, still quite different in terms of uh, speed, size, quality, and application. Who's buying these machines? Some people call them consumer printers. And I absolutely cringe when I hear that because most consumers are not buying them. There for a while, some of the companies that uh, manufactured these were positioning them as consumer printers saying, oh yeah, everyone will have not just one machine in their home, but they'll have multiple machines in every room or, you know, throughout their home and they'll be printing everything imaginable and you won't need to go to uh, Amazon or online or go to a shop to buy products, you just print it yourself. Well, no, no, that's, uh, that's not happening. Consumers will be a very big market for parts coming off of these mostly industrial grade machines. And some consumers are buying these, but they're more of the engineering students, uh, the geek families with a geek father or mother with the geek kids and, and, uh, and, and, and engineering uh, students and, and bona fide uh, makers of things. And maybe we'll see more of that if these systems get better and easier to use. And, and really the, the real obstacle is, is content creation. Creating uh, the 3D models with uh, CAD software is not easy. Uh, even if you use you know, the simple, uh, simpler uh, freeware or shareware type software products, or they're, they're, it's, it's still not trivial. It's, it takes a lot of effort to produce something meaningful that's good quality. And so most of these machines are going to two groups. One, companies of all sizes. Ford told their people, if any of you engineers, and they have thousands of engineers, want one of these, we'll buy one for you. So companies of all sizes and educational institutions. Those are the two biggest groups buying these machines, like the IDP labs here in South Africa. How many labs are there now, Dion? About 35. 35? 25 IDP labs. I did a product lab, which is like a fab lab, but a uh, different uh, model and much easier to set up and much lower cost, uh, are equipped with these low cost 3D printers. And so I wanted to share this quickly just to show that most of the money still is being generated by the industrial machines, even though the, uh, more, you know, more than 12,000 units, industrial units, uh, compared to 278,000, but still most of that money because of that average selling price that I was showing you. How many of these companies are around, these low cost? Uh, 3D printer companies. Anybody like to take a guess? Couple of thousand. How many? Couple of thousand. A couple of thousand. That's not a bad guess. Anybody else? Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Now we're talking about brands, companies that are manufacturing and selling these. Well, the answer is nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I'm serious. At one time, we were saying at least 300 brands. The last time I was in China was about uh, 11 months ago, and somebody who's been in this industry for a very long time in China told me, he said, Terry, there could be 1,000 brands in China alone. And I got to thinking, wow, probably so. A lot of these companies are developing these products, and they're using their native language to market and sell them with you know, their uh, web, web pages and so forth. And so you never hear about them unless you can speak that language. And so there could easily be 
2,000 or 10,000, but we don't know. I don't want to say there could easily be, but there, it's possible. It's, it's possible. So, so these are some of the, the nations around the world that have national programs in additive manufacturing. And, and I use that term loosely when I say national programs. They have some effort being funded by the, the national, federal, or, or central government in their nation. And this is not all of them. These are just some of them. And so I'm going to take you for a ride around the world, a trip around the world. We're not going to take a stop at each of these locations, but some of the key ones. And since we're here in South Africa, we'll, 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 we'll talk about it. These are among my favorite pictures that I was lucky enough to shoot back in 2001. Uh, almost 15, well, it would be 15 years almost to the day uh, when, in Kruger National Park. Of course, this was down the Gons Bay, down south of Stellenbosch, and, and I got in the cage and shot these pictures. What an amazing experience. And so I've shown these to countless people around the world. I, I, I've done my best to, to, to share with a lot of people about my friendships in, in South Africa and the, the great work that you're doing here. And as part of that, I'd like to, to show a little bit uh, of what South Africa has to, to offer. Uh, Kruger National Park has is, is been a long time since I've been there, but it's a crown jewel here in, uh, here in your fine country. And speaking of, of, of South Africa, I had the privilege yesterday to tour the, the lab over here at the, here at the Science Park. It is my third uh, visit here, and it just keeps getting, like fine wine, it just keeps getting better and better with age. And, I, you know, Hendrik and, and uh, Milan and the Team David and, and Leslie and the, the whole, just, it, they're doing fabulous work. I wanted to show this, uh, the, the, what I really wanted to show, I guess is confidential, I it wasn't allowed to take pictures yesterday, some uh, looked to me like air ducts for some aircraft, probably military aircraft. I'm just guessing here. I don't know. Uh, but uh, Janae was kind enough to send this picture to me and a couple of others to show some PMMA. PMMA is a, a, a polymer that is used in a binder jetting system, the voxel jet system over here, so you can make these patterns for investment casting. So you, you coat these patterns and then you build up a ceram, uh, ceramic coating through a slurry and you build up the shell and then you burn out the, the, the interior and then you pour in molten metal to make an investment casting. And these are some examples of some of the, the complex geometric shapes that can be done with additive manufacturing on the voxel jet machine. And, and, and then earlier this week I had a chance here in Africa to visit a company that is producing these impellers, and these are not small. These are not small impellers. Uh, they, they range in size. They go into uh, air compressors, and I've been asked not to name the company or the, or the industry or the application, <laughs> but I can show the picture and talk a little bit about the, uh, the work that's being done here for this company. And they believe that they can, by using these additive, now in this case, they're using the voxel jet machine, machines, but not for the patterns for investment castings, but rather sand molds and cores to then build sand castings by additive manufacturing and then pouring the molten metal and bypass the tooling and the uh, cope and drag and all the, the cores and so forth, the traditional way, which lead times can be, they told us, nine to 12 months to get these, these, uh, these parts from, from Europe. And so the cost savings can be just on one impeller more than two million rand. And so you start to do the math on this and it becomes a no brainer when just on the, the, the just looking at cost alone, but then you also factor in the time savings and it just it looks like it could be enormous for this company, absolutely enormous. So these are impellers that are going into large compressors. Really interesting and, and, and it's being done here in the building next to us. Not the casting, but the, the, uh, the, the sand molds and cores. Uh, one year ago this week, I think it was this week, we had a chance to see the AeroSwift development. It's a partnership between uh, AeroSuit and CSIR to build this large titanium machine. And 
you can see three different angles. It was hard to get back far. It was a fairly big machine, very big machine, fairly small room, so it's hard to get back far enough to, to get an overall picture. Uh, this is Peter Sander. He was one of the keynote speakers last year. He uh, heads up the uh, emerging technologies and concepts at uh, Airbus and really a, pr a strong proponent and, and leader. 100% of his time, vice president level, dedicated to additive manufacturing. Great guy. In any case, uh, we got a chance to see the, the machine. The work was launched in early 2012, big uh, build envelope, five kilowatt laser. And last week I was lucky enough to, to see the first part, not the part itself, but I got a picture of it, so I wanted to share that with you. So that's a milestone. So looking forward to seeing more parts. It sounds like they'll have a flight part demonstrator, hopefully by the end of next year. That's what I was told this morning. So making progress. And I also wanted to just acknowledge this uh, additive manufacturing network here in South Africa and the organizations that's contributing to it, that's a part of it. And you know some of the, the, the top universities in terms of the R&D, some instruction, and development of uh, additive manufacturing. And, and, and of course, CSIR, uh, this network I, bl I believe is being partially funded, I know it is, by the DST. And, and then Aerosuit is a part of it. I'm, I'm hoping that, I don't know if, if, if one year from now is, is, is too ambitious, but at some point in the foreseeable future, we see more than just one company as part of this network. I think that's important. University work is, is, is uh, critical. Uh, government uh, contribution is critical. I think the commercial application and involvement of companies is also a very big part of that three-legged stool. And so I'm hope, hopeful that we'll see more uh, commercial activity as part of this network in the future. Okay, let's go to South Korea. So I just want to, you go to a South Korean show, uh, an exhibition, and you see all of these FDM clones, these little uh, material extrusion with a thermoplastic, usually PLA or, or ABS on a spool, you know, puts it down layer by layer. You see, so many brands. I mean, just incredible. This one stands out because they're doing Ultim 9085. This material is quite special. It's from the kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Boeing, Airbus, and others use it for flight parts. There are thousands, probably tens of thousands of parts flying on both Boeing and uh, Airbus aircraft. And, but in the past, you've needed to spend a lot of money on the Fortis level machines from Stratus to be able to run this material. And, and the reason this material is special is because it's a uh, it's, it's very good strength to weight ratio and it has very low um, smoke and toxicity emissions. So it works well for aircraft parks. And so I have this part with me. And if you want to see it, I'll pass it around, but the group is kind of big and I know I'd get it back, but uh, I'll just have it up here if you want to see it later. Or, or if we have somebody who can just keep an eye on it. Uh, ah, what the heck. <laughs> so that's Ultim uh, 9085, built on this machine that sells for about $13,000. And that's what sets us apart from these uh, quite expensive Fortis machines from uh, Stratasys. Oh, also the, uh, the heated... The, 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 the FDM patent that is tied to the heated build chamber is something that Stratasys has owned for many, many years. So technically, you cannot pump heat into the build chamber. You can get heat off of the, the extrusion tip that, you know, just naturally, and if it's enclosed, but you cannot, you know, legally pump heat into the build chamber. Well, that patent expires the middle part of next year. So that will enable these types of materials and others to be processed in these kinds of machines. When I was at the uh, demilitarized zone, this is at the border between North Korea and South Korea. It's the, the most guarded border in the world. There's an incredible number of military there. And I had a chance to uh, go to this train station. And you can buy a train ticket from this train station to Pyongyang. That's the capital of North Korea. And I bought a train ticket right there. That's it. I, I paid one, 100 won, which is just under $1. I couldn't use it, though, because not, they're not yet operating. 
And so I couldn't figure out why they, it's all set up. They, you know, you can get in line, and, uh, but you'll be waiting a long time. I think they're optimistic that at some point they'll be able to run trains back and forth. But it's, I don't know if it was a tour thing or what, but I just thought that was very odd that you can, uh, you have a train station. Now, you, you can also go to Seoul from here, so the, the train station is operating to Seoul. But you can, uh, according to this, uh, go to Pyongyang. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe next time. China. So they're building big machines like this. Uh, most of them are directed energy deposition machines, which really means using a blown powder in the path of a hot laser. They're, all, they're also a wire-based machines too. So you're putting it, it's almost like a 3D welder, and they're using multiple axes, three, four, five, even more than that, axis machines to, to guide the, the, the path of the, the laser. There's some strengths and limitations to these machines compared to powder bed. If you want to do really intricate, complex parts with internal channels, fine features, you're, you're, you're going to be using a powder bed machine like you have here in South Africa. Although there is a lens machine at CSIR, and that is, uh, right? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And that's a directed energy deposition machine. So in any case, how did I get off onto that topic? Ah, so. That's how this was built with the, we believe, a blown powder. Well, well we, we're not even, haven't been able to confirm, even though they're two friends. I, I did, have not seen this machine or part, but I have two friends that, that went to this lab and saw the machine, but they didn't see it running. Nor do we know for sure that this was built on there, but I was told it was. Uh, you can see there's a lot of machining, post-machining that was done to the part. But uh, yeah, it was uh, supposedly built on the machine. This is probably, probably the most interesting company currently in China. It's called Bright Laser Technologies, BLT, which in the United States stands for Bacon Lettuce Tomato Sandwich. So, and they go by BLT. They call themselves BLT. And I go, okay. And so, <laughs> and so this is the CEO, fairly young guy, some beautiful parts. They offer a machine, looks a, a lot like uh, the EOS uh, metal machines. In fact, they own 11 EOS metal machines, uh, 24 altogether. So the remainder are uh, machines from, from their own company. So they have a lot of experience in building metal parts. And the part quality is good. It uh, looks like the machine. I, this is a picture of a picture. I didn't see the machine. So this was just on the wall at, at an exhibition back in December. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would say China in general is, is quite a ways behind uh, even here in South Africa, you guys are doing amazing work compared to China's working hard. They're making big investments, uh, but uh, they have a lot of work to do. This company is an exception. Most companies are not doing anything like this or even university work. <coughs> have you ever taken this train from Shanghai to the airport? It's, uh, it levitates through magnetics. It's called the maglev. This thing is incredibly fast. So I'm sitting in there and I take a picture over 300 kilometers per hour. The only time I went almost that fast was in Germany in a car. I went 265 kilometers per hour in a little Audi. I was not driving. I was scared to death. I thought we were going to die. I really did. But this, this train is very smooth and quiet and fast. And it's a, if you get a chance, uh, go for a ride. So speaking of Germany, this uh, I find interesting too. I mean, there's a lot of development, metals development, EOS, concept laser, SLM solutions, realizer, who am I missing? The work at the Fraunhofer Institute of uh, Laser Technology, ILT, which, well, if you're going to talk about that this afternoon, that, that, that development? Yeah, so well, if, at breakfast this morning, told me that, that uh, Fraunhofer ILT, which is the Laser Institute in Aachen, uh, Sister Institute Production Technology, is introducing a $30,000 metal machine. Fairly small build volume, but might be great for uh, lab work, testing new materials, and so forth. So, but uh, the, the IP, by the way, the original patents are held at that same institute, Fraunhofer Institute, ILT. I, I know miners, I probably met these two guys, I'm still in touch with miners, but that patent expires, the, the, the original foundation patent expires one month from today. So we'll see what happens. And now there, of course, are many other patents. And, and so one patent is just one patent, right? But still, you got to look at what happened. You know, the, most of the laser centering foundation patents have expired. Most of the sterilography, the binder jetting, 
Uh, a lot of these patents are expiring, really opening things up. So we're seeing uh, laser centering clones. We're seeing, of course, a lot of FDM clones, uh, many stereolithography clones, and, and now uh, maybe some of these uh, lower cost metal developments as well. So what do we got? Ooh, I got to I got to move. Um, these. I'd like to have some special questions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So quickly, uh, parts from Airbus, one of Airbus's company, Premium Aerotech. They are in production as of earlier this year. I shot these pictures. These are production parts going in this transport here. Uh, Airbus has been incredibly open to me. They said, can I show them these parts? Can I take a picture? Yes. Can I show these parts? Yes. Uh, please don't take pictures of this, though, uh, if you would. I would really appreciate it. More than 25 new designs, many using topology optimization, which is really letting mathematics decide where to put the material to optimize the strength to weight ratio. And so incredible designs, but they are very sharing of what they're doing. And I just wanted to show you a couple. One is a spoiler. I think Peter last year mentioned the spoiler. And so what's a spoiler? Well, if you've uh, been on a plane lately and you know when you hit the tarmac when you're landing, these things flap up on the, the, and they, on the wings and they act as brakes or help to, to, to slow the aircraft. And so they were inspired by the, a water lily to come up with a design that, you know, we, uh, nature has been around for a long time and there's a lot we can learn from nature. And I think that uh, this is one of many examples of you look at uh, plants and birds, insects, and so forth, they're, they're, uh, the wings and the bone structure and so forth. And, and so I think uh, we're just getting started with that. But uh, that's a whole field. I mean, really, if, you, if, if you're a researcher, a young person, and you want to do something really interesting, start looking at some of these natural structures, bamboo, for example, and how that could map to additive manufacturing fascinating uh, possibilities there. This is a, a part they call a hydraulic uh, reservoir rack. It was 127 parts and 27 fast fasteners consolidated into just three parts. Three parts. I talked to Peter recently and he believes they are on track to 3D printing 30 tons of metal monthly by the end of 2018 incredible amount of material, staggering. This uh, was given to me just recently from Northrop Grumman. These are the part numbers and the number of parts flying on all these aircraft. You add up all the parts, there's thousands of flying parts on these uh, mostly military aircraft and some special programs, I'm guessing, uh, secret, classified, that we'll never hear about. And this is as of October 2013. So. Three years have passed since, so that's how long it takes for them to release this kind of information. Uh, voxel jet. I want to talk about, oh, five minutes. Okay, so these are PMMA patterns for investment castings. We, we have a culture of art and sculpture in Loveland, Colorado, just about uh, 15 kilometers south of Fort Collins where I live. And there are a lot, a lot of great uh, artists and sculpt sculptors. And so these are patterns that become sculptors. And, they started out, you know, how do they get the data to build these patterns? And notice that they were joined by, they were glued, so some of them uh, are quite large. These are pieces of, of paper here. And so they started by doing these clay sculptures, and then they 3D scanned these clays, which are about two-thirds full scale, and then sent that to a company that processed the data and then came with these patterns, shipped the patterns back, and then they cast these parts and they weld these parts together. When they're done, you can see fingerprints or you know, just the, the fine detail. Even where they weld these together, they finish it up so that you cannot see the weld lines or anything. It's pretty remarkable. But anyway, uh, just want to talk because you do a lot of casting related work here and we're also doing that in the United States. Mark forged a company that uh, just want to say that you know, they, they do Kevlar, uh, carbon and fiberglass filled FDM-like parts. What sets this part apart is the, the quality of the base material, the nylon. This is the new onyx material, which is a chop fiber carbon, carbon uh, filler. And the, the strength and stiffness is pretty amazing. So or actually, I should start. I'm sorry. I should start here. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Otherwise, the, the print roll will get bypassed. Uh, so let's see. I've got three minutes. Uh, HP, I talked about that last year. I think it's going to be a game changer. 
If they deliver what they say they're going to do, uh, they are going to, I think, put a serious dent or uh, impact laser sentry machines because it'll be difficult to uh, justify the additional cost and the slower speed of laser sentering. For example, this part that I have here, if you're building 55,000 of these or fewer, it's less expensive to 3D print them than to build a mold and injection mold these parts. And so I'll pass this around as well. This is a PA-12. When these parts finally work their way to the back, if somebody could like maybe collect them and bring them to me, I would really appreciate that a lot. And so they have a, an open systems model where they have material suppliers. These are the original four suppliers of materials, but many others will be added to them. Uh, partners, uh, software, design software partners, and then uh, application industrial partners as well. And uh, I'm just very impressed by what HP is doing. And this is an example of a new a company that really is all in and, and really uh, believes that, that it'll become a very big part of uh, HP Inc. in the future. And, and they, can, they can print at the voxel level and control each voxel. A voxel is a volume element. About 20 by 20 by 50 microns would be an average voxel. They can control the porosity, the hardness, stiff, stiffness, elasticity, thermal conductivity, color, uh, electrical conductivity. Here they printed a, a strain gauge within this part, within this link, and I saw real-time numbers showing up on a computer as there was a, a tensile uh, testing going on. Really incredible. A lot of investment going on around the world. Just mention this one here, Carbon, $220 million of investment so far. It's a startup company. And here's a carbon, it's a photo, it's basically a stereolithography machine. But they are really good at selling. <laughs> and I, I don't mean that in a negative way at all. I, I don't mean to, to, to uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, they're using light to set the shape and heat to set the mechanical properties. They believe, and it's too early for me to know if that'll happen, that it, these phot photopolymers will perform as well as thermoplastics in terms of uh, their stability over time. Uh, time will tell. Bike designs, uh, this is interesting, these lugs, uh, these water faucets, the water having to have going through these, these channels, uh, 3D printed electronics, this is a, an Israeli company that you might want to take a look at. And last but not least, um, one year ago, I showed our uh, granddaughter, who's about, uh, I don't know, less than two weeks old at that time. She just turned one a week ago Sunday. In fact, this is a smash cake. It's a tradition in the United States to give the, the, the one-year-old the cake, and then they just, she was, she was covered in cake icing from head to toe, literally. Uh, but yeah, uh, Olaf and I have done some work for NASA. This is a little, she's a little commander of a space shuttle. We had a Halloween just two days ago, so. These are two of them, and then she was a bumblebee that night. So, yeah. Okay, in summary, if you look at only additive manufacturing stocks, the, uh, you know, it's not a very good picture, and there's reasons for that. If we had time, we'd talk about it. But if you look at everything else, it's pointing in the right direction. It's a really a hot, interesting time to be a part of this industry. It's exciting, and, uh, well, it looks like I may have gone over a, a minute, and. I'll leave it up to you, Hendrik, as to what we do now. So thank you for your time.